Coming up on Extra Credit, we make our own bath bombs, learn how computers work, discover careers in robotics, and so much more. Stay tuned. This program is made possible in part by Michigan Department of Education, the state of Michigan, and by viewers like you. and it's so good to meet you. Welcome to Extra Credit, where we meet interesting people, explore new ideas, and discover fun places together. Each episode will introduce you to people who use math, science, sports, and writing to make the world an interesting place. Today's theme is engineering, and we've built quite the show for you. First, I want to introduce you to our co-host for today. Hi friends, nice to meet you. My name is Brianna. Let's get started by learning a little bit about robotic engineers. I wonder what a robotic engineer actually does. Hmm. Robotic engineers plan, build, and maintain robots. They plan how robots will use sensors for detecting things based on light or smell. Robotic engineers generally work in offices. They may also visit work sites where a problem or a piece of equipment needs their personal attention. Robotics engineers typically need a bachelor's degree in robotics or mechanical engineering. Their programs usually include courses in mathematics and physical sciences. Robotic engineers design robotic systems such as automatic vehicle controls and computer vision, investigate equipment failures and difficulties to diagnose faulty operation and recommend remedies, and review or approve designs, calculations, or cost estimates. Robotic engineers need to have critical thinking skills, math skills, and mechanical skills. Being a robotics engineer is rewarding in so many ways. Robotics is a really exciting field because you can have an impact on so many different areas in society. It's so rewarding for me to be able to take something that I've programmed in lab and throw it into the water and see it actually work. It's a highly collaborative um, endeavor where you need people with lots of different expertise. So within robotics, there are many different places that you can go, for example, in space. A lot of times you can't do a manned mission because it's too expensive or too long. And so robots are having a huge impact on that field because they can go further. They can start to do things that are repetitive, things that most humans might not find enjoyment in doing over and over again, but also things that are dangerous. Robotics will help older adults and an aging population by empowering people to live the life that they want to live with the assistance that they need. One of the greatest things that I get to do in my work is spend time with a lot of social robots. One of my favorite robots is Jibo. Hey Jibo, what do you like to do for fun? You know, I like to dance. Hi, my name is Erica Gomez and I'm an engineering manager at Amazon.com. One of the best things about working in tech and at Amazon in particular is that I get to bring my dog with me to work every day. My job is to help make sure software gets out the door and her job is to nap under my desk and snore very loudly. My name is Jerome Holman and I'm a program manager on Team Xbox and I have a really fun job basically bringing the hardware and the software together to give you all the games that you love on your Xbox. <laughs> when you look inside a computing device, you see a bunch of circuits, chips, wires, speakers, plugs, and all sorts of other stuff. This is the hardware. But what you don't see is the software. Software is all of the computer programs or code running on this machine. Software can be anything from apps and games to web pages and the data science software that me and my teams use at Amazon to understand how customers behave. 
but how do the hardware and the software interact with one another? Let's start at looking at a computer's central processing unit, or CPU. The CPU is the master chip that controls all the other parts of the computer. A CPU needs to do different things, so inside it has smaller, simpler parts that handle specific tasks. It has circuits to do simple math and logic. It has other circuits to send and receive information to and from different parts of the computer. The real magic of the CPU is how it knows which circuits to use and when to use them. The CPU receives simple commands that tell it which circuit to use to do a specific job. For example, an add command tells the CPU to use its adder circuit to calculate a new number. And then the store command tells the CPU to use a different circuit to save that result into memory. Just like numbers, all of these simple commands can be represented in binary ones and zeros, or on and off electrical signals. The binary commands are stored in memory, and the CPU fetches and executes them in sequence, one after the other. This sequence of commands is in fact a very simple computer program. Binary code is the most basic form of software and it controls all the hardware of a computer. These days, nobody writes software in binary. It would take forever. Today, the software we write looks more like this, or this, or even this. Programming languages like these let you type in commands and something that looks a lot like English. To draw a rectangle on the screen, you just need a single command. This high level command is converted into hundreds or thousands of simpler binary commands that the CPU understands. Software tells the CPU what to do, but when you're listening to music and browsing the web and chatting with a friend, your computer is running multiple pieces of software all at once. So how do all of these programs get on the computer in the first place? And how can the CPU run them all at once? To find out, we'll have to take a look at the operating system. The operating system of the computer is the master program that manages how software gets to use the hardware of the computer. For example, I helped create the Windows operating system that runs on most personal computers. The operating system is a program with special abilities that let it control the other software on the computer. It lets you install new programs by loading them into your computer's memory. It decides when a program is run by the central processing unit and whether that program can access the computer's input and output devices. And when you think your computer is running many programs at once, in reality, it's the operating system that's quickly switching between programs sharing that CPU for fractions of a second. Inside every computer is an operating system managing software that controls the computer's hardware. The software is a series of commands made of simple binary code, and that binary code is just electrical signals flowing through billions of tiny circuits. Computers have the potential to do all kinds of amazing things. But the only thing that makes computers smart or useful is you. When you learn to code, you get to define the problem you want to solve and write the software that turns those ideas into reality. That gives you the power to build things that matter to you, your community, and the world. I was first introduced into computer science when I was in high school. My first experience with uh, technology was when I was very young, about six years old. It was part of our curriculum at the school I went to. And there I made my way into computer science class and I loved it so much that I ended up double majoring in both theater and computer science. Growing up as a kid in the inner city, I never learned to think about coding and it's so important. <laughs> All of my, my girlfriends, I think, have taken a computer science class, and I'm the odd, I'm the odd person out right now. Having access to technology, and, and for me in particular, being able to code, was a multiplier. I wanted to do computer graphics. I wanted to be a graphic designer. 
And when people found out, they laughed at me and, you know, all these things. And I'm like, man, I don't care. I think it's cool. And, you know, I'm learning a lot. And some of my friends have jobs. I mean, the opportunities are endless for somebody who's getting into computer science because that's a, a job that's in high demand right now. We have all different types of people who work in computer science. We need the participation of more women, more people of color, to provide a different perspective and a different lens on which problems matter and how we should approach these problems. It's not just programming. It's not just building things. It's an entire different way of seeing the world. There's a way that even when you're coding, you can help make this world a better place. And it's a really fun place to be right now. I hope you guys want to be entrepreneurs. You want to have your own business. You want to create an opportunity for your family. You want to create your own app or your own platform or whatever. And I'm here to say today that you guys can do that. Computer science for everyone, literally everyone. Uh, some people think you have to be a genius to like get it and understand it, and it's so far from the truth. I know it can be intimidating. A lot of things are intimidating, but uh, you know what isn't? Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Don't let anybody tell you that you cannot do something. If you're a high school student that's thought about taking computer science, just go after it. We need diverse teams of people in order to make products that reflect uh, what our world looks like. It's not just a means to an end. It's this thing that gives us hope to solve every problem that the world potentially has. We're on a mission to help change the face of computer science. We're going to learn to code together, bring the family, gather around. Anybody can do it. You should try it. If you can dream it, you can do it. Push yourself. Anybody can learn. Just give it a try. Got bugs? No, not those bugs. Sometimes computer coders find mistakes or glitches in their programming, and they call these glitches bugs. Let's learn about why all coders expect to face a good number of bugs every time they work to solve a problem through computer coding. Programming's a game. It's something that you and the computer are working towards together. But you're gonna fail a lot. Just get comfortable with failing, because it happens. When you program, you have to get it wrong, because that's how you learn. When you do make mistakes, you're like, okay, it's fine, I can fix this. Everyone gets bugs, whether you're beginner, intermediate, advanced, everyone gets bugs. When a computer's not working the way it's supposed to, the way we want it to, we call that a bug. I get bugs. I get bugs. I get bugs. I get bugs. I totally get bugs. Everyone, Everyone gets bugs. bugs. Debugging is basically just looking through your code and correcting your mistakes and fixing it. There are four really important steps that you want to follow when you're debugging. The first thing you want to do is describe your problem. So figure out what's happening. What did you want your code to do and what is it actually doing? Second step is you want to hunt for bugs. So figure out what is it in your code that's causing that. Step number three is you want to try out small solutions and see how they affect your code. And then finally, step four is you want to document what you've learned. Debugging is maybe the number one thing that can help you become a better programmer because you're seeing the mistakes you made. I don't delete that. Can you help me with this for a second? Can you help me with this for a second? Yeah. <laughs> That's... Most of the time I spend debugging is finding the bug, but once I find it, it's easy to fix. What's this? Get out of here, bugs. Did your parents put that there? Maybe, I don't know. I like debugging with other people because they are like a second brain, which doubles your computing power, so you can figure out bugs twice as fast. Here we go, Dude, we did it! Experts make bugs. They make big bugs. In fact, your goal should be, as you go along, make bigger and bigger bugs that need to be squashed, because that just means you're doing something worth doing. You know, the more you practice, the better you get at it, the easier it will be. I can debug. I can debug. I can debug. I can debug. I can debug, and so can you. Writers, are you ready? I just received word that Dr. Blotch is going to check in with us to see how we're doing with our creative writing challenge. The challenge involves creating an invention to solve a problem. Get ready. Oh, 
Um, well, Dr. Blotch, hello. Um, I'm, I'm still working on my invention right now. Uh, no, I have changed my mind. The people of Antarctica need goods now. Therefore, you must present now. Um, okay. Well, let me just, uh, let me just, like, uh, really quickly. Um, okay. Uh, Stop delaying, Marjorie, your invention. Okay, um, so, Dr. Blush, here is my invention. I created light-up socks. Um... Light-up socks, you say? How very intriguing. Uh, are they smelly? No, 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 no. Do you have your pitch ready? Um, well, I'm, I'm still working on it, Dr. Blotch. Um, but here's what I have so far. Um, light-up socks. Buy them. They come in different colors and they're flashy. Mm. Marjorie, I'm going to be terribly, brutally, horribly, crushingly, painfully honest with you. That was terrible. I do not want to buy your product right now. I doubt your ability to form coherent sentences. Um, well, maybe I need to work on my pitch. I do believe you do. Have you seen any of my infomercials for Mooncats, Marjorie? I sometimes start with a question. Very, very compelling. You should try that. Okay. Um, what about, do you, do you ever go outside at 4 p.m. in the winter and feel like it's the middle of the night? Do you ever stumble around trying to find your way home? Is that yes, right? very good. Now, provide more details about why the socks uh, are all good. Convince me that I need to buy them, or are they just... Ordinary stocks, uh, uh, blanket. Okay, um, well, people should try our new light-up socks. They're, uh, they're solar-powered, um, they're rechargeable, and they come in 14 different fashionable colors. Yes, very good. Now I won't keep adding more details about the socks, Morgan, including the price, and you'll be ready to sell. I, of course, will get 90%, you will get one, the Mooncats will get nine. Um... Hey mathematicians, are you ready for our daily math challenge with our friend Diane? Today we will use our minds to think through a problem. Last time we helped Diane finish up plans for a sandbox by figuring out how many square feet the sandbox covers. Now we'll use our math strategies to figure out how to design a dog park. Let's get started. Hey everyone, Diane here. Welcome back. I think you'll all be happy to know that our sandbox project is looking promising. No sand will escape and there will be fun for all. That project got me thinking about another thing that would be great to have, a dog park. What is better than seeing dogs having room to frolic and play? First, we're going to look back at one of the sandboxes and see how that would work for a dog park space. Don't worry, we're not losing the sandbox. Just some ideas started. Just getting some ideas started. Here is our plan for the sandbox. We have a six foot by eight foot space and a four foot by four foot space. Last time, we found that the area was 64 square feet, but we used squares to help us figure it out. I wonder if there is another way to do it so we don't have to put squares all over the place. That was a lot for me to keep track of, and some of these projects could get pretty big. I remember last time someone noticed there was a connection between the side length and the number of squares in each row, and we tried multiplying. If you remember, we decomposed the sandboxes into those two parts, a six foot by eight foot section and a four foot by four foot section. When we found the area for both of those, it ended up that we had 48 square feet, 
making up one part and 16 square feet making up the other. I'm still wondering if this will work for other kinds of figures. Let's see how it goes with this idea for a dog park that I already thought about. When I thought about this, I wanted the dogs to have some space to run, so I made it longer. Here we are with a dog park that has these dimensions. It's L-shaped with a 15 by five foot section and a three foot by three foot section. The neighborhood really wants to know the total area that the dogs will have to play. Thinking about what we know about area, how would you start thinking about what the total area is? Yeah, so some of you said to start with 15 rows of five. We could put squares down, and I heard someone say something about five rows of 15. Let's put some squares down and see if that will help us. So here I see that in one row, there are five one foot squares. And there are 15 squares going the entire length of the dog park. How do we know, or I'm sorry, how do we want to move forward? I heard someone say, if we filled in all the rows, we would have 15 rows of five. So we could find the total number of square feet by doing 15 times five. How could we do that? I agree that five is definitely a friendly number for me. So I could use my knowledge of counting by fives to arrive at the answer, or I could also use some of my knowledge about decomposing numbers to make it more manageable. I know I can decompose 15 into 10 plus five, and then multiply each part by five. So 10 times five equals 50, and five times five equals 25. If I add those together, I get 75 square feet. Can you imagine counting all 75 squares? That would take a long time. And we still have another part of the dog park. There's this three foot by three foot section. We can't forget about that. So I'll put down some squares and let's see if we can figure out the area without having to use all of them. What do we think we will need to do? Can you whisper it to me? Yes, we are going to have three rows of three squares. So three times three equals nine. But nine what? Cats, ironing boards? Right, nine square feet. Now, let's combine these parts that we decomposed to find the total area. We have 75 square feet plus nine square feet, and that equals 84 square feet. I wonder if that is a little too small for all the dogs that will come to play in the dog park. Maybe we could make it 10 feet by 15 feet but keep the three foot by three foot section the same. I wonder how that would change the area. We know that if we were to put squares down, we would have 15 rows of 10. Do you think you could try solving this without squares up on the plans? Give it a try. How did it go? I heard some great strategies, but at the center of all of them was multiplying the length and width of the dog park to figure out the total area. When I did 15 times 10, I thought about what we talked about with powers of 10. The digits shift one place each time we multiply by 10. So 15 times 10 must be 150. So this dog park would be 150 square feet. The three foot by three foot area will stay consistent at nine square feet. Let's add those together to get the total area of the dog park. 150 square feet plus nine square feet to equal 159 square feet. How did the area of the dog park change 
when we change one of the side lengths. Take a look at the plans and think about it. Those are some really good ideas. So I heard someone say, there's more space. Someone else said, it's almost double the whole area. And another person said, one of the parts was exactly double. Hang on, everyone. I heard some great noticing, and I really want to share it with you all. Some said that one of the parts was exactly double from what we saw before. The section that has 15 feet by 10 feet doubled in area from when the section was 15 feet by 5 feet. I noticed that 10 is double 5, but the other side length stayed the same. So how could it double? I really wonder how that happened. Do any of you have any ideas? Oh, okay, so when the side length was doubled to 10 feet, it ended up making another space that had the same dimensions as the original. Ah, I think I see what you're saying. So when the side length went from five feet to 10 feet, it ended up that there was another section of 15 by five. So you're saying, doubling one side length would double the whole area. I wonder what would happen if both side lengths were doubled instead. So now we have a 30 foot by 10 foot section and we're gonna keep that three foot by three foot section the same. Go ahead and make a prediction. How will the area change now that we've changed another side length? How much do you think it will change? You have your predictions? All right, let's look at the plans and see how your prediction compares. So we've got 30 feet by 10 feet. This looks a whole lot like the powers of 10 we talked about before. Ah, memories. Anyway, we know that we can multiply the side lengths to find the area. So 30 times 10 equals 300. Our new area is 300 square feet. Whoa, that's a lot bigger than what we had before. So our original section was 15 feet by five feet. That gave us an area of 75 square feet. I wonder how much bigger that is. Let's look at the plans and see what we can find out. So in this section, we had 75 square feet. And then when we doubled one side length from five feet to 10 feet, we had 150 square feet. And someone told me that it was double the original. And now we doubled both side lengths and we have 300 square feet. Oh, you noticed something? What was that? 300 is double 150? That is some good noticing. So our area doubled again. That means that our space is now four times the size of the original section. Wow, changing side lengths does more than I expected it to. That seems big enough for Great Danes and Poodles all the way down to the tiny Chihuahuas. Thanks for helping again, multiplying the length and width to find the area of different rectangles. This is going to help make my future project planning so much more efficient. Bye everybody. Welcome to Impact at Home, where we practice interrupting prolonged sitting with activity. My name's Kemper, this is Claire, and we're here to help get you moving for the next eight minutes. You'll be surprised at what these moments of movement can do for you and the rest of your family so that you can stay active and healthy at home. So go ahead, get up, and let's get started. For this movement activity, we are going to be focusing on the importance of range of motion. Before I jump into that, let's get warmed up. Let's watch Claire here so she can jam us up with some torso twists. Follow me as well as I walk through the importance of range of motion. As you all know, range of motion can be very, very beneficial 
in our athletic performance, in pre preventing injury. Okay, if we have some athletes watching this video, the more range of motion your joints and muscles can go through, the more force you actually can produce as well, which could improve your athletic performance. It could also prevent you from getting injured when you get tackled, kicked, trip, what have you. So from here, we're gonna keep our glutes tight, our abs are tight here, and I want everybody to rotate as far as they can, left to right, moving that low back, moving the obliques and abdominal muscles through their full range of motion. A couple more times here before we move on to our next exercise. And relax, great. Now we're gonna do our reverse lunge with a reach. So watch Claire, she's going to step back and as she sinks into that lunge, she's going to reach her arms back, opening up our shoulders, opening up our chest, and opening up the hips as well. Range of motion here is super important to get that full extension, which can be very beneficial as we get a little bit older. If that's too much for you and you're fatigued, stay with me here. We're gonna go with a reverse lunge. Again, trying to really sink through that full range of motion, our hips all the way down. Awesome work. Awesome work, keep going. We have a couple more reps left. Take your time here, take your time. This is not a workout where you wanna get as many reps in as you can. I want you to focus on the quality of the movement, full range of motion, one more rep, and come back up to those torso twists. Feet about shoulder width apart. Make sure your glutes are contracted, and we are driving by rotating the torso. Try not to move the hips like this. We want our hips relatively still. And then we're driving that elbow back, opening up the muscles in our lower back and our core. Awesome work, awesome work. You might not think of this right now, but when you get to be your parents' age, you might be struggling with some range of motion if you don't practice those habits now. So do yourself a favor <laughs> and continue this in your weekly routine. Switch it to exercise number two. We're going back to our reverse lunge with the reach or take the reach out if it's too much for you to do and stick with the reverse lunge that I'm showing you right here. Whew. Breathe through this, okay? Breathe. Try to pay attention on where you're holding tension too. If you feel like you're holding tension in your shoulders, try to relax your shoulders. If it's in your low back, try to relax your lower back. We have about one more movement left. Well, sorry, one more repetition left and rest. Beautiful. How you feel? Good. Look good. Next group of movements, we're gonna do a squat hold. So Claire's gonna go into a very wide stance. This is a sumo squat stance. She's gonna sink her butt back and down. And from here, she's gonna throw a reach in, opening up towards the ceiling, and then on the other side. Now, things to think about when you're here. We're opening up the hips mainly, okay? So if you need to hold onto a couch to do this, fine. Uh, also, if it's a little bit difficult to get down there, go wider with your feet. But we're gonna hang out here. Not only are you opening up your hips, you're really strengthening the muscles in the lower body. So your hamstrings, your quads, these big muscles that are responsible for locomotion and doing the things that we do, walking, standing, getting in and out of the car. We wanna keep those strong. A Couple more seconds left here. If you're following Claire, she's opening up her torso the ribs, the lats, the chest, the shoulders, and switch, we're gonna to go to our couch now. Next movement. We're gonna go into a dip position here, okay? So we're gonna bring ourselves up from the couch, we're gonna lock out our elbows here to start, and then we're going to sink our hips down and back up by bending our elbows and squeezing the back of our arms here. If this is too difficult, just take your range of motion down a little bit, or walk your feet in towards the couch, it'll make it a little bit easier. But here, we're stretching the shoulder in front of our body as we go down, and we're squeezing on the way up. Couple more reps here. Great work, and rest. We're going back up to that squat hold. Wide stance, get your hips back and down. Open those knees up. Breathe here with me, okay? Breathe, beautiful job. As you're reaching up, if you're doing what Claire's doing, try to exhale when you throw that reach in, all right? It's always good to make sure your breathing is relaxed when you're stretching, when you're doing range of motion activities like this. So watch your breathing. Keep holding here for a little bit longer. I know it burns. Y'all are doing great. Stay with me, please. 
in three, two, one. Let's go back to that tricep dip. Y'all are doing great, great work. Try to push yourself now this last round. Get a little bit deeper, squeeze a little bit harder at the top, and exhale when you come up. Big inhale on the way down, exhale as you come up. Make sure your butt's not getting too far away from that couch. Keep it real close, almost there. We have one more rep, and rest. Awesome work, awesome work. Shake it out for a second. The last group of movements we will do is we're gonna do a pelvic lift. This is working the backside of our lower body. Claire's gonna have her feet on the couch. She's gonna drive her hips up, squeeze the butt, slowly back down, and repeat. If you're with me, we're gonna keep our feet on the ground, okay? Heels stay down, drive those hips up, squeeze your butt, back down. Again, try to get your hips all the way up. Again, we're opening up the front of those hips, focusing on full range of motion in our hip extended position and then control back down. Good. Whew. Take your time. Glutes are gonna stay on at the top. Hamstrings are gonna be on at the top as well. Make sure you're breathing here, abs are tight. We're gonna finish with this movement, so stay with me here, okay? Couple more reps. Whew. Let's get one more. Up, squeeze, down, and relax. Awesome work, everybody. You nailed it today. I hope you enjoyed today's movement break. Impact at Home is a chance to apply the skills you may have learned in your PE class to improve your health. To learn more about the health benefits associated with daily movement, visit impactathome.umich.edu. Now don't forget to fill out your daily log. We will see you again during our next workout. Support for this program is provided by the Michigan Public Health Institute and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, STEM scholars. I'm Dr. Kelly Christopher, and I'm so excited to talk to you today about chemical reactions, but also I'm excited because we get to create our very own bath bombs. Now, first I wanna give you an example of the chemistry that goes behind bath bombs. A chemical reaction is basically when different substances are combined and then they create, or their atoms rearrange to create completely different substances. So, Today, we're gonna to work with a couple of uh, substances to show you a quick chemical reaction. For this first experiment, you're going to need baking soda. You're also gonna need citric acid. Citric acid can be bought at the grocery store or any place that sells canning supplies. People who make jams and jellies might use citric acid to preserve their uh, creations or let's just say you have vegetables that you wanna harvest, they might use citric acid in canning. But if you have ever peeled an orange or uh, then rubbed your eye or uh, squirted lemon juice in your eye, you would notice that your eye starts to sting. Citric acids are made from citrus fruits. And so just so we don't sting our eyes, I'm gonna put on some safety glasses as well. For this activity, you also need a small baggie, teaspoon measure, and a quarter cup measure, and just some water from your sink. What we're gonna do, I'm gonna open up our baggie. You might even get someone to help you with this because it can be a little bit difficult holding everything. We're gonna take a teaspoon of baking soda. And then a teaspoon of the citric acid, and I'm trying to get just the right amount. Now this is the part that is very time sensitive. Once you're ready to add your liquids, 
you're going to have to close the baggie right away. So either uh, just be prepared to close it right away or have someone else hold the baggie for you so you can add the water and then seal the baggie. So first I'm going to just fill up my quarter cup measure. All right, let me just move that. And then just quickly You're gonna add the water and you'll see a chemical reaction starting to take place. Now in this case, we took baking soda and citric acid and then they combined. Now one of the products of this particular chemical reaction is carbon dioxide. When we breathe in, we need oxygen to live, but when we breathe out, we breathe out carbon dioxide. That's what's in this baggie. So in this particular chemical reaction, carbon dioxide is formed. However, carbon dioxide is a gas. So we took two solids and a liquid, but we created a gas. We started with baking soda and citric acid. The chemical name for baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. The molecular formula for citric acid is C6H8O7. When combined with water, or H2O, all of the molecules rearrange, and the product is water, carbon dioxide, and sodium citrate. This is an example of a chemical reaction. Now I want you to feel the baggie. You might notice that it's gotten cold. Well, what happened here? That's because this is an example of an endothermic reaction. Thermic, of course, meaning heat, endo meaning in or absorb. So this particular chemical reaction absorbs heat and the water turns cold. So now we're ready to make our bath bombs. These are the supplies that you're going to need to make your bath bombs. First, you're going to need baking soda, citric acid, Epsom salts, cornstarch, vegetable oil, You'll need a little water. You'll need some fragrance. Food coloring, uh, spoons, I have a fork here. You'll need a couple of droppers. You'll also need some sort of mold to um, make your bath bombs, to form your bath bombs. I have some bath bomb molds that I'm gonna use today, but you don't have to have a mold. You can make your own mold like this could be a mold. This came from a little diced peaches or something. But the important thing is that the container is a little bit flexible so that you can pop the bath bomb out after they're dry. You, or you could use something like an ice tray, but of course, one of the flexible ice trays. So again, that you can pop your bath bomb out at the end. You also need a couple of bowls, measuring spoons and measuring cups. First, we're gonna start with our dry ingredients. We're gonna start with our baking soda and we're gonna need six tablespoons of baking soda. When you look at your measuring spoon, a tablespoon usually is the abbreviation capital T-B-S. So you're gonna need six tablespoons of baking soda for this. And it's very important that you get a, a level scoop. Um, that just means that the, whatever ingredient that you're adding is flat against the top of the measuring spoon. You could even use a knife to get off any excess. So that's two, three, four, five, six. Next, you're gonna add three tablespoons of citric acid. Oh, I have to do this a little differently, but be careful. Next, we're gonna add four and a half tablespoons of our cornstarch. So you're gonna need two types of spoons. You're gonna use four tablespoons and one half tablespoon. One half, you'll look for the one half measure on the spoon. So let's start with the four tablespoons.
And the last dry ingredient that you'll need are Epsom salts. I'm gonna start with the larger tablespoon and then the half tablespoon. And then we're just going to stir this up. Now I'm gonna set that aside and we're gonna get our wet ingredients. So these are our wet ingredients. First, we're going to take uh, two and one quarter teaspoons of water. So I've got my water here. You don't need a very big bowl for the liquid ingredients because all of them are pretty small measurements. For the teaspoon, the abbreviation for teaspoon is a lowercase t, s, p. So be sure to make sure you're using the right type of measurement for the teaspoons. Next, we're gonna add two and one quarter teaspoons of vegetable oil. Vegetable oil is kind of hard to measure out of the big, um, the big uh, container. So I put a little bit in a bowl just to help measure. So we're gonna need two two and one quarter teaspoons of vegetable oil. Now you're gonna to have to select a fragrance for your bath bomb. I'm choosing oatmeal milk and honey. So I'm going to add two tablespoons of my fragrance oil. And finally, <clears throat> you're gonna to have to pick a color for your bath bomb. Since my fragrance is oat milk and honey, oatmeal milk and honey, I'm going to use yellow. I feel like that'll be appropriate for this fragrance. But you know, you can choose anything you want. You wanna add about five drops of food coloring, okay? Now, of course, you don't have to add any color if you don't want to. And then you're gonna stir this. Now you might remember we've talked about density and water and oil do not have the same density. So you will notice that these will separate, but that's okay, just stir it up again as you're doing this uh, activity. So these are all my wet ingredients. All right, so now you, we have to combine the wet ingredients with the dry ingredients. But this actually is a pretty long process because we have to add the wet ingredients to the dry ingredients very carefully. And it's also important that we don't add too much liquid because if you add too much liquid, you're going to um, have too much of an, a reaction and we wanna make sure we just have a small reaction each time and we're able to create uh, a bath bomb that has the right consistency uh, so that we can put it in our molds. If it's too wet, they won't go in the molds. If it's too dry, uh, they'll crumble. So let's show you how this first drop of our liquid goes and be sure to fill your dropper up all the way. You can see a chemical reaction starting to take place when we add the wet ingredients to the dry ingredients, but we actually do not want to see that. So as soon as the reaction starts taking place, you're gonna take a spoon and you're going to smash down the liquid ingredients. And you're gonna do this over and over again. You're going to add one dropper full, and notice I didn't say one drop, but one dropper full of liquids. And then as soon as the reaction starts taking place, you're gonna mash down. Now this is going to take some time. All right, this is almost ready. You'll know that it's ready because when you pinch it, it'll stay uh, in a, like a little ball. Um, but if it just breaks apart, it's too dry. But it's very important that you don't add too much liquid so it's, uh, so don't, uh, be impatient with this activity. Take your time and wait until the consistency is just right. So the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take your mold and you're going to put a little bit of vegetable oil in the mold. It's kind of like uh, when you're baking a cake and you might grease the pan, 
before uh, you put your cake batter in there. You're gonna put this oil in the mold before you put in your bath bomb mixture, just to make sure it's easy to pop the uh, bath bomb out of the mold. So I'm gonna take a mold and you just start scooping the bath bomb mixture into the mold and pressing down as you shape it. This recipe makes enough for probably about two of this size mold, but depending on the container, it might, uh, you might have enough for a little bit more. Also, if you don't have enough liquid as you're doing this activity and you, your uh, mixture is too dry, simply add a little bit more water and vegetable oil to the, uh, to the dry mixture until it's the right consistency. Once your molds are filled, you're gonna to have to let them dry and it's gonna take overnight. So I prepped one last night and I have the mold here with the bath bomb in it. So I'm just going to get it out of there. Ooh, it's a little bit, it can be a little tricky. Try not to break it though. There we go. And I made a couple others the other night too. So I've got my bath bombs and then I had a little bit extra left over again. So I made some little bitty bath bombs with those. So now I'm just going to show you what it looks like when you take your bath and you put one of your bath bombs in the water. And I've just got a little bowl of water here to demonstrate. I'm just gonna take one of my little bath bombs and I'm gonna just put it in the water. And you can see it's starting to fizz a little bit. And the cool thing, in addition to this chemical reaction, you've got the Epsom salts in there and that helps with the muscles and your sore muscles. The fragrance smells really good. So you should be able to have a really relaxing bath. Well, that's all for today. I hope you learned something and I hope you had fun. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Anytime you create something new, especially when you're creating it to solve a problem, you'll run into challenges. What should you do when this happens? Give up? No, of course not. Let's learn more about how we should deal with failure and stick with things even when it gets tough. In sand sculpture, you've got to know that failure is part of the program here. You got to expect it, you got to plan for it, but if you persist, it's just going to get nothing but better and more exciting for you. That's the name of the game here, just persistence. Stay with it, you'll love it. This lesson is called Building a Foundation. In this lesson, we'll work on a task that is meant to be really difficult. You guys will figure out how to make a structure at least as tall as one of these cups. At least that tall. Ah, there we go. And it's got to be strong enough to hold the weight of a book. Nope. 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 <laughs> there might be times that our creation doesn't work out. Ah, right, we lost it, but let's recover. I have the perfect idea. I need more gumdrops, though. And there might be times that we get frustrated and want to give up. There might be a lot of those moments. Uh, cannot get this! But if we keep on trying, give it our best shot over and over again. I'm still working on it. Then we're sure to get it before long. Success! Persistence is all about hanging in there, 
when you really want to give up. If you want to create something new and different, there's going to be a lot of failures along the way. I was about to fail anyways. The trick to persistence is choosing to keep on going and learn from your failures instead of quitting because you're frustrated. Frustration actually just means there's something wonderful around the corner. I wonder if this will work this time. So don't quit before you get to it. I had so much fun learning with you today. Hey, do you remember the word that means sticking with something even when it gets hard? That's right, persistence. So the next time you face something challenging, remember to keep at it. See you next time. On the next episode of Extra Credit, we learn how to draw a rooster, get tips on how to tell an interesting story, and so much more. Get your extra credit on the Michigan Learning Channel. This program is made possible in part by Michigan Department of Education, the State of Michigan, and by viewers like you. Thank you.